Hello and welcome to the second video podcast in Canada in the Making, Understanding Canadian History. We're now in Unit 2, the Indigenous People in Canada Before European Contact. We're going to be covering a vast amount of history today, approximately 20,000 years. So sit back and let's get started. The learning objectives for this unit are Number 1. Explain current theories about how the Americas were first populated. And number two, understand the variety and complexity of indigenous history and culture in pre-contact North America. So today we're going to be talking about the indigenous peoples of the Americas. We'll be focusing a little bit more particularly on the indigenous cultures of the northern part of North America, because this is a Canadian history course, but we'll be speaking a little bit more generally about how the Americas came to be populated by human beings in the first place. One of the first things you have to understand about indigenous history is that the Americas, for most of the history of human beings, have been completely isolated from the rest of the old world. So when I'm referring to the old world, I'm talking about Europe, Africa, India, Asia, all of that massive amount of land was interconnected. And although we normally wouldn't think about, say, China and Europe communicating in the Middle Ages or ancient Roman times, there was communication and diseases and technology spread all throughout the old world. However, for most of that same time period, the Americas were completely isolated and thus the history of the peoples of the Americas took a very unique course all unto itself. We don't know for sure when the exact time period that the very first peoples arrived in the Americas, but it was probably around 25,000 years ago. And from that point onward, uh, the Americas uh, developed into an incredible variety of indigenous cultures and languages spread from the very high Arctic of North America down to the very tip of South America. The variety of cultures and strategies for living within the Americas is absolutely astounding. From the Inuit who live in the high Arctic, to indigenous tribes that live in the Amazon rainforest, the large complex farming societies that existed in what is now southern Ontario. And even to the massive cities and complex civilization built by Mesoamericans such as the Maya and the Aztecs, um, building monumental pyramids and cities that rivaled anything in Europe or the Old World. Studying indigenous history also requires us to not think just simply in one time period. Indigenous history stretches over thousands and thousands of years, and over that time, North America has changed dramatically. When the very first peoples arrived in the Americas, the world was in the grip of the last ice age. Uh, the landscape was more like uh, closer akin to the subarctic, and the animals who lived here were very different uh, than exist today. So let's talk a little bit about the primary sources that are available to historians to understand the history of Indigenous peoples prior to first contact. Um, so if you recall from the last podcast, primary sources are our evidence. They're our only type of evidence for the past. Um, and a primary source we defined as anything made by humans in the time period that we are studying. So if you're interested in, for example, um, the indigenous cultures that were living in southern Ontario, say 5,000 years ago, well then a primary source would be anything created by those people from 5,000 years ago that has survived to this day. So um, let's take a look at then what are the primary sources that historians can use to reconstruct the past. So first of all, we have archeology. span So archeology span is the uh, scientific and careful physical excavation of human remains and human settlements from the past. And archeology span can produce a wealth of information about past cultures, in particular when it's done respectfully and in coordination with modern day indigenous peoples, um, archaeology uh, is um, absolutely essential for us to understand uh, the far past. Coming out of archaeology are artifacts. These are the physical objects 
that um, have been left over from past societies. Now you can imagine that a physical object on its surface can only tell us a little bit, right? A tool is a tool, but a tool can tell us a lot about how people live, their strategies um, for uh, food and, um, and tons of things about one's culture. And if that's all you have, then that's what you will start to do your work to try to reconstruct the past. So artifacts are definitely an important part of doing that. We also have architecture or what is remains of architecture. So these are the remains of buildings from the past. So depending on where you are in the Americas, this can be um, quite ornate. So the buildings in Central America, which is where uh, indigenous people built large uh, complex civilizations and cities, um, pretty much the same as what you would see in any old world population. Uh, those buildings, many of those buildings still remain to be studied uh, now. And so that's certainly a wealth of information. In other parts of the Americas, though, uh, the indigenous people didn't build in stone. And so it's a little bit trickier then to reconstruct their buildings. However, uh, wood and other perishable materials sometimes do leave telltale signs in the soil that chemical analysis uh, through archaeology can still reveal a lot about. And so archaeology has still told us a lot about the wooden buildings that were used by farming societies in southern Ontario, for example, um, that we otherwise might not know about. Art, of course, is an important primary source for all human cultures everywhere. And of course, for indigenous cultures that lived in Canada prior to uh, first contact, there is a wealth of surviving art that we can look at, which get, reveals lots about a culture. And sometimes this art can be incredibly old. So for example, in Peterborough, Ontario, which is about a two and a half-ish hour drive from Brampton, um, in Peterborough, the, there are rock paintings that were done thousands of years ago by Indigenous people who lived in the area. Um, so art can be a very important primary source. Another primary source is writing. Now, writing is normally what um, we associate with historians. Historians like to look at documents, and we certainly do have examples of writing from the Americas prior to pre-contact. Uh, in Mesoamerica and in South America, there were many indigenous cultures that had written languages. Um, some of those languages have been, um, we understand very well. For instance, Maya and Aztec are understood very well. Others haven't entirely been deciphered. For instance, the Olmec language, the Olmec were people who uh, predated the Maya in uh, Mesoamerica and we haven't entirely we know they have a written language we've seen it but we haven't entirely been able to um, uh, decipher it what it what it means and other places written language wasn't um, uh, prevalent and so in places where indigenous cultures didn't utilize written language we turn to another source and that's oral history and oral traditions now traditionally um, um, European historians often didn't take oral traditions seriously enough uh, but that has really changed. Um, oral tradition has been proven to be remarkably accurate when we look at the past. Um, these are the stories that are passed down generation to generation. And storytelling um, and family lore is incredibly important in many indigenous cultures. And so this tradition of passing down this knowledge, um, we can use that knowledge to reconstruct a lot about the past. Events in the past, wars in the past, migrations of people in the past, all of that is often preserved uh, really well in oral tradition. So that's another important primary source. And finally, after first contact, we also have European sources. So these are the sources produced by Europeans when they came into contact with indigenous peoples. Now, sometimes that's all we have to go on, and so we do have to use them, but European sources can be problematic for a number of reasons. First of all, the Europeans often didn't understand what they were witnessing, and so they would interpret what they saw through their own biases, so their own lens of their own European culture. And so this gives us a very warped view of, of potentially what was actually happening. Um, and sometimes European sources are actively hostile, meaning that they're degrading the cultures that they see because, again, they don't understand them or they're different. And so for historians, working through sources that are biased and hostile is difficult, but it's, it is still possible to work with sources like that and actually to gain good information. So these are some of the variety of primary sources that historians use to try to reconstruct uh, the indigenous history prior to first contact.
So now let's turn to another type of research that has revealed quite a bit about um, the Indigenous past in the Americas, and that's genetic research. Genetic research has allowed us to um, start to put together a basic timeline of how the Americas came to be populated in the first place. So um, uh, genetic research has shown us, for example, that all Indigenous peoples of the Americas are all related. They all have a common ancestor. Um, which is much closer to them than um, any other common ancestor in the old world. And we know that uh, that common ancestor um, uh, came from Asia. So all the indigenous peoples uh, of the Americas from the Arctic all the way to South America ultimately have a common ancestor in Asia. Um, and also genetic history can tell us roughly when populations split. It has a clock of sorts because mutations show up in DNA at very regular intervals. Scientists can therefore look back at the changes in one's DNA and then date that to when different populations split from other populations. And this again has allowed us to start to reconstruct the story of how the Americas were peopled. Now, I should say, as we get into this discussion of how the Americas were peopled, and that this is uh, an area of massive ongoing research. And what we know about um, uh, the migration of human beings into the Americas has changed dramatically over the past two decades and continues to change on such a regular basis that I find that I am updating this um, lecture regularly as new discoveries come to light. Um, so, for instance, genetic research, which I just mentioned, is a relatively new area of research. It only really began about 20, 30 years ago. Um, and so it's only now that we can really conclude that all Indigenous peoples of the Americas have their ultimate origin in Asia. Um, so we know that Indigenous people would have arrived in the Americas at least 13,500 years ago. I say at least. Um, and that's because there are some sites which suggest a much earlier arrival. Um, and so we just know that 100% people were there by 13,500 years ago, but, um, and the jury is still out on exactly the earliest date of arrival. It was likely much, much earlier than that, um, probably more like around 25 to 30,000 years ago. Um, so the other question is how many Indigenous peoples were living in the Americas prior to uh, first contact and we think that there were at least 50 million people spread out between the two continents but again that could be an underestimate. It could be as high as 100 million, some scientists think. Um, obviously, it's very difficult to reconstruct uh, past population sizes. Um, there was no census taken at the time. Um, and as soon as Europeans arrived from the Old World, they brought with them Old World diseases, which were um, uh, just absolutely devastating to Indigenous populations who had no natural immunity to it. So these diseases spread like wildfire and decimated the populations, um, pr in some cases prior to even Europeans reaching inland. Um, so reconstructing the population is, is very difficult, but we can say with some confidence that at least 50 million people, but potentially as many as 100 million. Uh, for comparison, um, Europe, we think at the time, had about 50 million people living in it. Um, so all of these issues continue to be very much debated um, and new discoveries are constantly refining and changing what we know. So um, all of, that's why there's these question marks behind all of these things because we, um, we are learning more every single day. So to understand how the Americas came to be populated by human beings, you do have to know a little bit about human evolution. And uh, human evolution, obviously, we've also, uh, our knowledge of this has transformed because of genetic research and fossil research um, over the past two generations. And so what we can say now with confidence is that every single human being on the planet, every single human being, traces our ancestry to just one place, and that is Africa. It was in Africa that we first evolved into modern human beings. Sometime around 150,000 years ago, we had evolved into modern human beings. So what do I mean by that? If you jumped in a time machine and you went back in time to the African savanna and kidnapped somebody's baby and brought them back to you know, the present day, uh, that child would likely grow up no different than any other modern human being, playing video games, texting their friends, you know, um, 
they would be us because we were us approximately 150,000 years ago. Uh, the remarkable thing is, is that we hadn't yet left Africa when we first evolved as modern humans. Uh, related humanoid species that are not us had already left. You could think of them as cousins of us. Uh, some uh, examples are Homo erectus. Uh, Homo erectus had spread into Europe and into Asia. Um, and uh, Neanderthals is another um, uh, related hominid species to human beings. And as human beings eventually left Africa, modern human beings, when we did leave Africa, we eventually displaced all of those related species. Um, we don't know exactly how, perhaps we killed them off, um, perhaps they just simply um, were outcompeted for resources. A in any respect, they are all gone, and now there is only us, all modern human beings, so we don't have any other related species with us anymore. Um, and interesting is that there was likely a little bit of hanky-panky um, between uh, humans and Neanderthals, for example. Uh, we can tell because Neanderthal DNA has been sequenced, and we can say that everyone pretty much outside of Africa, so all modern human beings outside of Africa, have an itty bitty bit of Neanderthal DNA in there. So there was some interbreeding, but for the most part, all these related species were just wiped out. So when human beings began to leave Africa around 100,000 years ago, it's just amazing how quickly human beings spread spread out all over the planet. So for example, uh, by 70,000 years ago, human beings had actually crossed over into Australia, um, which is amazing as well, because although water levels were lower at that time, it still would have required our human ancestors to build boats in order to arrive in Australia. Um, by 40 to 50,000 years ago, human beings had reached um, Europe, and uh, by 40,000 years ago, we were well into Asia. Now, the question is then, when did human beings make the big jump into the last area that had not been touched by human beings, and that's North and South America. So during the last ice age, uh, which um, uh, was at its height around 25,000 years ago, um, the entire northern hemisphere of the planet uh, was covered mostly in a massive ice sheet. And during that time, water levels around the world were much lower than they are today. And in fact, North and South America were connected by a land bridge, a bridge which it, um, a, a bridge called Beringia, which connected North America to Asia. Beringia is right here. So obviously this is uh, what today is the Bering Strait and it's a very rough ocean, but uh, in that time, it was actually land. And so sometime around that time, uh, human beings made the big leap into, um, into the new world, this untouched, uh, these untouched continents. And there are a few theories about uh, when and how human beings did that. One of the first theories to become popular among scientists of how human beings came into the Americas is the Clovis first theory. So this theory is named for the discovery of um, human um, uh, uh, primary sources, human um, artifacts from Clovis, New Mexico. Um, and uh, these artifacts were primarily these spear points. You see an example of a Clovis projectile point there. And they have a very distinctive way that these spear points were created. And uh, this culture uh, that produced these spear points um, uh, spread out all over much of the Americas during the Ice Age. Uh, the Clovis people were likely big game hunters, so they would have hunted animals like the mammoth. Um, and they lived in an environment which would have been um, subarctic. So this would have been at the height of the last ice age. And the idea was is that they um, came over uh, when the um, ice began to melt, the ice sheet that covered the, um, the, the northern part of the world. And as cracks in that ice sheet appeared, then human beings um, followed animals uh, through the cracks into the Americas. The oldest sites um, of Clovis artifacts date from around 11,000 to 11,500 years ago.
So here's an image which shows you how that might have happened. So the ice sheet begins to break up around 13,000 years ago, and this creates an ice-free corridor that human beings might have passaged through on their way down into the southern part of what is now the United States, thus producing the very earliest Clovis sites around 11,000 years ago. Um, however, um, the ice sheets really blocked that path prior to 13,000 years ago. So they wouldn't have been able to go overland prior to that point. And so this meant that for a long time, scientists believed that the Clovis people were the very first people into the Americas. However, a discovery in Mount Verde in southern Chile, that is the very tip of South America, really threw that Clovis first theory into disarray. So there was evidence in Mount Verde of human occupation from 14,500 years ago. So this is well before the earliest Clovis sites, which dated from around 11,000 years ago. Moreover, the date of 14,500 years ago uh, means that human beings somehow found their way around those massive ice sheets, which we knew blocked the land route um, from it from until 13,000 years ago. So the question was how human beings had gotten so far into the Americas at such an early date. And so the new theory that came about was the coastal route theory. And the idea is that human beings were using boats and moving along the coast of the Americas, probably subsisting off of fishing. And there would have likely have been um, a small ice-free zone all along the coast. And because they would have been um, in boats, they would have been able to move relatively quickly. So it's not that crazy of an idea to think that within just a few thousand years, human beings had made it all the way down to the tip of South America. Since then, there has been other evidence to support the idea of a coastal route. For example, here is an image of a fossilized human corporalite, that is fossilized poo, uh, which has been radiocarbon dated to 14,300 years ago, which was found in a cave in Oregon, um, a cave that would have been high enough um, up that um, it somehow uh, has survived even when ocean levels uh, uh, rose after the last ice age. Um, and this also provides evidence, again, of the coastal route that human beings were using, um, and it uh, is still older than the Clovis first theory. So using genetic research, we can really get a much closer look at um, how peoples moved all the way around the world after the first human beings evolved in Africa around 150,000 years ago. So based on DNA um, evidence, uh, we can say sometime between uh, around 25,000 years ago to uh, is perhaps as early as 15,000 years ago, but most likely much closer to the other end, to 25,000 to even 30,000 years ago, is when um, a Native Americans split from uh, the populations in East Asia. So that means that it's sometime after that point that the Americas would have been populated. And so taken together with the evidence from Mount Verde, and the evidence of places like in Oregon, the uh, corporalite, the fossilized poo, uh, we can say with some confidence then that the Clovis peoples were not the first peoples into the Americas, although likely the Americas were populated over several waves of migrations. So the coastal route might have been the first peoples coming into the Americas, but then as the ice sheets melted, subsequent um, groups of people moved into the Americas. And this is also borne out by the different uh, DNA patterns that we see amongst indigenous populations in North and South America. So it does suggest that there were several waves of migrations, the very first of those migrations being around 25,000 years ago. So then in the thousands of years that indigenous peoples lived in the Americas, an incredible variety of different cultures, strategies, and lifestyles developed from the, everything from the high Arctic and uh, cultures such as the Inuit to um, the incredibly complex city-based civilizations of the Aztec and the Maya in Central America. So a millennia of adaptations across the continents prior to the arrival of Europeans. Another really important human development is the invention of agriculture. 
Now, the earliest uh, evidence we have for agriculture is in the old world, approximately 10,000 years ago in a part of what is now the modern day Middle East, um, probably around what is now Iraq, human beings invented agriculture. That is, they had learned to domesticate wild plants to grow them uh, themselves and to over time uh, breed the best versions of those plants so over time you know the plants became more nutritious and when human beings learned how to do this it meant that they could stop moving around so much human beings prior to the invention of agriculture had to follow herds of animals and so as a result populations tended to be small and we did not see permanent settlements at all once agriculture was developed which was followed as well by the domestication of animals, uh, human beings were able to stay in one place. And eventually we have um, settlements and eventually cities and eventually full-fledged civilizations. And thus the very first civilizations we see of human beings are in the Middle East, in the area that scientists have dubbed the Fertile Crescent. Uh, but agriculture, once it was invented, spread like wildfire throughout the old world. And so almost everywhere where agriculture was a viable strategy for living, human beings adapted it in the old world. So we see it popping up in India, popping up in China, popping up in Europe and popping up in Africa. But the Americas were completely cut off from those developments. And what's absolutely amazing is that agriculture was independently invented by Native Americans around 8,000 years ago, we think, between 8,000 and 6,000 years ago. So a little bit um, uh, later than in the old world, but it was independently invented. And then the same process happened in the Americas. So wherever agriculture was a viable strategy, it spread to that area and indigenous people adapted it. So um, certainly the city-based civilizations of Mesoamerica in Central Central America, agriculture was at the heart of that, but also agriculture was incredibly important for the indigenous people who lived in what is now southern Ontario. There were uh, very um, large farming based societies uh, with semi permanent settlements here, too. So the very first domesticated plants in North America were very different from the domesticated plants in the old world. And you probably don't realize this, but some um, uh, of these plants, which are so important in the modern world today, were unknown to old world populations. So corn or maize was probably the most important crop for indigenous peoples of the Americas. It was the staple cereal crop, um, but also peppers um, and tomatoes. Uh, and cacao. The bottom right there is what you see is uh, cacao pods on a cacao tree and it's from uh, cacao that we make chocolate. Chocolate was invented by Mesoamericans, indigenous people who lived in Central America. So tomatoes, no person from the old world had ever tasted a tomato prior to first contact. So that means no one in Italy had ever tasted a tomato, if you can imagine that, prior to some time in the 16th century. Same goes for India, they had never tasted any tomatoes either. Potatoes, potatoes were also a New World, North American um, uh, and South American crop that was unknown to the Old World. So no one outside of the Americas had ever tasted a potato either until sometime in the 16th century. And that's really quite amazing if you think about it. So now let's take a look at the uh, status of Indigenous peoples within uh, what is now called Canada in the northern part of North America just prior to first contact with Europeans to give you a sense of the history of that period. So here you see a map which is somewhat of an oversimplification which shows you the variety of different tribes and languages that existed in what is now Canada prior to first contact. So this is a, a map which shows you predominantly the major tribes but it's again it's a simplification there's many more tribes than just this and the language groups what I mean by language group is that everyone in a given area say one color here speaks related languages to one another it's not that those languages are necessarily mutually intelligible meaning that they may not necessarily understand each other but they're closely related so it's very similar to the way languages anywhere else in the world can be sometimes closely related and then they're categorized into language groups so for example 
um, uh, French, Italian, Spanish. Those are all Romance languages because they're all descendant from the language Latin. Um, or English is part of the Germanic language group. So it's part of the group that includes German and Dutch and uh, Danish, for example. And so similarly, when we look at, say, the green area here, this large green area, is the Algonquin language group. So within the Algonquin language group, we have Cree, we have Ojibwe, we have Algonquin as well, confusingly. So these are different tribes. So there is the tribe called Algonquin, but there is also the language group Algonquin, which includes all these other tribes, such as uh, the Huron, the Ojibwe, uh, the Cree, etc., etc. Uh, just the same way that, say, the Germanic language group in Europe would include German as a language, but also English and Danish and Dutch. So in the region which we now call Canada, there were at least 50 distinct indigenous cultures that we're aware of prior to first contact, and the, they fit into 12 different language groups. Many more languages within those language groups, but this, these are the larger language uh, families that we talked about on the map previous. And we know that um, throughout North America, there were extensive networks of trade and cultural exchange. Uh, we know this from a variety of region. We can see goods that were created in um, hundreds and hundreds of even thousands of kilometers away uh, being found in different locations. Um, for example, we've also uh, seen European goods, early European goods that would have been traded with indigenous people on the coast after first contact uh, showing up in archaeological digs. Uh, in the interior of North America, long before Europeans actually reached there, their goods had already gotten there. And all of that is evidence of these extensive networks of trade and cultural exchange. Uh, generally speaking, uh, indigenous societies were incredibly uh, varied, um, many, many different ways of living, many, many different uh, structures in terms of social organization, in terms of governmental structures, very, very different. But there were some broad similarities, and we'll talk a little bit about some of those broad similarities as well. And then we're going to go from different uh, the different physiographic regions of Canada and sort of look at each of those regions and give you a general overview of the different indigenous peoples who lived in those areas and the way they structured their societies. Um, the other thing to keep in mind too is that this is just really what I'm going to be presenting is just a very much a snapshot in time just prior to first contact. Indigenous cultures changed dramatically over time because the environment changed. So as we'd already talked about when people first came into this region, uh, this was a subarctic climate. So it was very cold, very few trees, and obviously the strategies for living in that type of environment would be very different from what you would use in, um, in the way that the climate is today, which is a very temperate warm environment now. So this is a map which I showed you uh, in the previous lecture and it is a population density map in modern day Canada and I noted that nearly uh, the entire population of Canada lives within about a hundred kilometers of the United States border and I suggested that the reasons for this are um, not just because people want to be close to the United States, but but that there are actually historical, environmental, and geological reasons why people are living where they live. In that the southern parts of Canada, particularly in southern Ontario and in what is now BC, provide the best um, environment in order to live, the easiest environments to live, where we have the nicest temperate climates uh, and climates which would provide abundant food resources. And that's uh, that's why historically people also lived in these areas. And so when you look at this map, which is of modern populations, and if we could look back in time and see where did the vast majority of indigenous people live prior to the arrival of Europeans, we would see a very similar map in terms of that the further north you went, the smaller the population of humans. And that the greatest populations of indigenous peoples were in fact in southern Ontario, southern Quebec, and in what is now uh, British Columbia um, over on the west coast over here. This region of Canada, which is now becoming more populated in the interior here, uh, was not as sparsely populated, was not as heavily populated in ancient times. Um, this region has attracted more populations more recently because of the uh, exploitation of fossil fuel resources, particularly oil, the oil sands. Um, and, and historically, because that area is, is rather dry and not 
actually suitable to uh, agriculture prior to the introduction of modern technology such as irrigation, um, it didn't support as large of a human population as it does now. However, southern Ontario and southern Quebec, this region right here, this region over here in British Columbia, these were the regions where most Indigenous peoples lived, although we find Indigenous people living everywhere, even the extreme Arctic, the largest populations were down here in the south. So it's very difficult to generalize uh, between different Indigenous groups living in the Americas because, as I've already said, their societies were incredibly diverse and varied um, in their approaches to life and the world. Uh, there are some really general characteristics that we could say are, are relatively common amongst most Indigenous cultures within what is now modern-day Canada. One is the um, uh, spiritual belief system is somewhat similar between different Indigenous groups. Um, there's often um, the spiritual beliefs are of very central importance to their society, which is not that dissimilar from other human societies as well. Um, within indigenous societies, uh, dreams and vision quests, that is um, quests that you would take within a dream world, become uh, are very, very important and uh, have seem to have somewhat common application amongst many different indigenous tribes. There's generally a respect for the spirits of animals and plants uh, for which their lives depended upon these resources, so that's not surprising either. There was quite a bit of warfare between different groups. Um, in Next week in our unit podcast, we'll talk about one of the um, large wars that happened after the arrival of Europeans between the um, uh, uh, Wendat and the um, uh, Haudenosaunee Five Nation Confederacy. And these two groups were at war for several generations. So there was quite a bit of war between different groups as uh, uh, people migrated around and competed for resources. Generally speaking, in most indigenous groups, uh, the gender roles were much more relaxed, at least in comparison to Europeans. Uh, women had much more power within uh, Indigenous societies compared to Europeans at that time. They were relatively egalitarian. We even see some aspects of Indigenous cultures being matriarchal, that is led by women in some ways. So uh, an example that I would give would be in the Haudenosaunee, where it was a clan of older women, a council of older women that would choose the male chieftain leaders. Um, so there was this balance between men and women that wasn't really uh, prevalent in European society at that time at all. Uh, so we do see a little bit of matriarchal elements. We generally, though, speaking, um, indigenous cultures did follow more of a patriarchal system. And patriarchal is definitely the predominant system around the world. And that's where older men tend to hold most of the power in society. And certainly that was the system that Europeans employed at that time. So now I'd like to uh, take a look at the Atlantic and Gulf region, and we're going to be going through each physiographic region in Canada, and we'll discuss uh, some of the indigenous peoples who lived in that region and what their lifestyle was like prior to first contact with Europeans. So <clears throat> the Atlantic and Gulf region of Canada was the land of the Mi'kmaq, the Maliseet, the Beyotuk. Uh, the indigenous peoples of the Atlantic and Gulf region lived in an annual cycle of, of seasonal movement between living in dispersed interior winter camps and then larger coastal communities during the summer. This region had a climate which was generally unfavorable for agriculture, so regular movement with the seasons was very important. And as such, they did not build permanent structures. For example, in the spring, they would set up camps near river mouths and bays to harvest the spawning herring um, and other fish, as well as hunting waterfowl and collecting eggs. Later in the spring, they might move to the coast where there was abundant cod and shellfish and marine animals such as whales and seals, which could be hunted. Late summer, when the worst biting insect season was done, they uh, might move more inland for the migratory bird hunt, um, as well as trapping freshwater eels, which also annually migrated from the ocean to interior freshwater uh, lakes and, and rivers during this time. During the winter, uh, the larger tribes would usually break up into smaller groups and hunt in the interior for moose, caribou, and bear. Other animals such as rabbits, bears, porcupines created a rich and varied diet. So this gives you an idea of, of the of what it was like in the Atlantic and Gulf region for the indigenous peoples there.
In the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Lowlands, this is the region of Canada in which Sheridan College is situated. This was a region which was ideally suited for agriculture. And as I've already mentioned, this was an area which had supported a very large pre-contact Indigenous population. This was the land of the Haudenosaunee, also known as the Iroquois, the Wendat, also known as the Huron, the Seneca, the Onondaga, the Mohawk. Um, the uh, uh, indigenous people who lived here uh, uh, lived in large farming societies. They grew corn, beans, and squash. Um, we think, for example, that there would have been about 50,000 uh, Haudenosaunee people living in what is now called Canada around 1500. Uh, they lived in palisaded villages, that is villages that were surrounded by uh, a wall made out of uh, wood. Um, and within that wall, the village would be made up of about 30 to 50 long houses. These were long wooden structures. Um, and in these societies, women actually played a very important role and had quite a bit of power. Although um, the tribes were led by male chiefs, uh, the male chiefs were chosen by a council of older women, of clan matrons, as they were known. So this was really um, an interesting dynamic of shared um, gender power, uh, at least compared to the Europeans that they were uh, meeting, who were um, much, much uh, more patriarchal, meaning that the men held all the power. Prior to the arrival of Europeans, um, uh, several of these groups actually organized themselves into a large sort of confederacy, a state, uh, you might think of it as. Um, the Five Nation Haudenosaunee Confederacy or the Five Nation Iroquois Confederacy uh, was a powerful group that stretched all across southern Ontario and northern New York State. And this group pretty much controlled that region and uh, they were their greatest rivals were to the north uh, were the Wendat. Um, and the Wendat were also a very large state-like civilization. Um, and the Wendat and the Huron were bitter enemies. And when the Europeans arrived, as we'll talk about in next week, when the French arrived in that area, they found themselves uh, caught in the middle of that conflict and being forced to uh, choose sides. So next we'll turn to the Canadian Shield and Interior Plains. This, these two physiographic regions had a common cultural and uh, language group, um, which included the Cree, the Ojibwa, the Algonquin, the Sioux, the Blackfoot, and the Dene. Um, generally, all the people who lived in this region, because it was not at all suited for agriculture, lived as hunters and gatherers. That is that they hunted for wild animals and, and gathered wild plants uh, to survive. Um, but the region was also filled with abundant game. Um, generally speaking, human beings, when they live in hunter-gatherer society, live in much smaller groups that occasionally get together um, in larger groups for seasonal gatherings. And we often see in hunter-gatherer societies that there is a much greater gender equality with little rank distinction because everyone needs to be directly involved in food production in one form or another. So the, there doesn't tend to be a very complex hierarchical structure. And often because women are providing sometimes um, a, the majority of the tribe's calories through the gathering, um, they often hold a lot more power in these societies than they do in more settled um, agricultural based societies. So they live in small bands, but then larger seasonal gatherings would be held in order to uh, exchange uh, marriage partners and so forth. Um, the, um, uh, these tribes for thousands of years were spread very thinly over the woodland area of the Canadian Shield and into the interior plains. Um, they followed seasonal animal migrations in order to obtain meat and for food and used animal hides and bones for the making of tools and clothing. They traveled by canoe in summer and by snowshoes and toboggan in winter, living in cone or dome-shaped lodges covered in animal skins. Turning now to the Pacific Coast in the Western Cordillera, this was the other region of Canada which supported a very large indigenous population prior to first contact. This is the land of the Haida, the Tlingit, the Songish, and the Colmox. 
uh, this region um, uh, had a, a very unique culture compared to the rest of, of indigenous cultures in Canada. And uh, partially because of the mountains, there was not as much communication between one side and the other side, which allowed for the tribes on the Pacific coast to do, develop some really um, unique characteristics compared to uh, other indigenous cultures in Canada. Um, so the um, tribes were organized with chiefdoms um, and very rigid social hierarchies. The leadership was hereditary, which is very similar to what uh, Europe would have been at the time with kings passing on the kingship to their children and so forth. Um, and that would have been very similar to with the Haida, for example, which had um, uh, chiefdoms passed from uh, as a hereditary role from generation to generation. Um, the region, though, is absolutely abundant in food. There's lots of plants, plentiful stocks of fish, salmon and halibut, and shellfish uh, formed an important part of the diet as well, too. Um, at least 25% of the pre-contact population were slaves, um, and slaves formed an important part of their society. Slaves were gained during wartime, so warring between the tribes, um, and, and this just reinforce that social hierarchy within the different groups. The pre-contact population we um, estimate, as I've already said, was quite large. But um, uh, during the time of pre-contact, um, once Europeans started to reach the um, uh, east coast of the Americas, the diseases that Europeans brought with them, to which no indigenous peoples um, had natural immunity to, spread throughout the continent. And um, the the uh, introduced diseases into this region came long before the actual Europeans arrived. So measles, typhoid, smallpox, and this absolutely decimated the population living there. So once Europeans actually finally reached that area, they found it largely depopulated in comparison to how many people used to live there before. Um, tens of thousands, for instance, of the Haida would have lived in several dozen towns dispersed along the coast and the island, stretching all the way up to Alaska. So the most extreme environment within North America is the far north and the Arctic. And this was the last region of the Americas to really be populated. Although initially, um, indigenous peoples passed through this region on their way down south in the earliest phase of population of the Americas. Permanent population in this region didn't actually come until much, much later. Um, uh, the Paleo-Eskimo culture, um, which really stretches not just in North America, but there's a culture similar that stretches from Siberia, which is Russia, across the north all the way to Greenland, um, arose sometime around 2,500 uh, years. BCE. And uh, the Inuit, who are the um, indigenous peoples of Canada who live in the north now, moved into Canada around 1000 CE, so around a thousand years ago. And when they did so, they displaced the earlier natives who were living there. And the earlier natives, we don't know that much about them um, because of it, uh, um, a find near Dorset. Uh, they are sometimes referred to as the Dorset culture and the uh, Inuit are sometimes referred to as the Thule culture. The population of the Arctic therefore arrived really in two separate waves. The original population around 4,000 to 6,000 years ago um, evolved into the Dorset culture. A later wave, the ancestors of the modern day Inuit arrived around 1,000 years ago. Um, the original inhabitants, the Paleo Eskimos, were completely disappeared, and no one's entirely sure why, whether they were pushed out by the new um, Inuit, or whether they were uh, died of, of disease, or whether there was something else. Um, uh, but their culture disappeared and was replaced by the Inuit culture around a thousand years ago. Uh, so the people who live in this region are entirely hunter gatherers. Agriculture is absolutely impossible in this region. There's a strong reliance on marine mammals, so that is um, uh, seals in particular, um, and fish as well. And they have to move around a lot as they um, exhaust local food supplies. Um, also, the um, seasons, again, are extremely important in terms of where one moves for food resources.
So here you see a map which is tracing the genetic lineage of uh, the indigenous peoples of the far north. So again, just to sort of recap what I was saying before, the very first people arriving in the far north um, and staying permanently arrived around 4,000 to 6,000 years ago. And this is the same genetic group of people who also live in Siberia and Russia. And they moved and settled across the north all the way to Greenland, uh, which is now getting close to um, Europe. Uh, but then they uh, disappeared about a thousand years ago when the ancestors of the Inuit moved into the same region. So that's the red line there, who are the ancestors of all the modern Canadian Inuit today. Um, and the original Paleo Eskimo culture completely disappeared. And here you see a map imagining the uh, different um, territorial distributions of cultures in the area around 1300 uh, CE, or on this map it has AD, the old dating system. Uh, so where you see uh, blue, that is the um, uh, Thule culture, the Inuit culture, and um, the Dorset culture at this point uh, had already been pushed to only be, um, as you see um, at the uh, on the, the the east coast of Hudson's Bay and the north there. Um, and then also you see um, the Innu culture, which is, um, uh, we discussed, they were one of the groups um, in the um, uh, Appalachia uh, Atlantic Gulf region, who are uh, there at the northern end of their territory, and the Bealtic as well, part of that same grouping. And then uh, you also see, interestingly, the red is Norse. So we do know, and we'll be discussing this much more next week, but the Vikings, who were a European group, did visit and try to settle in the region um, in the Middle Ages. And so there were some sporadic attempts at settlement by Europeans during that time as well, although none of them took hold. So we'll be discussing that a lot more next week when we talk about the beginnings of contact between the Americas and the old world. And we'll also talk about just how devastating that contact was for a whole host of reasons.